Hi, I'm Pastor Naomi Cease Carriker, Senior Pastor of the Lutheran Church of the Nativity in Arden, North Carolina. Here we are again, worshiping physically, par physically apart, but spiritually together with the people and animals we are quarantined with. In the state of North Carolina, we are still living in a time of mandatory mask wearing. And as the sign outside of our church building says, love each other, wear your mask, wash your hands and keep your distance. And so we stay home and we keep our distance and we wear our masks to protect not only ourselves and our families, but our friends and those unknown to us. But in the, in the midst of this abnormal reality, you can be assured that God is with us. God's spirit is moving in this time of pre-recorded worship in your lives now and in every day to come. For this worship service, we will start a little differently with something we have done before, but let's do it again by lifting up and blessing those symbols that now represent a very physical act of loving our neighbors. We will bless our face masks. Whether you have one that you wear and wash repeatedly, or a bunch of different ones in rotation, or sparkly ones, or ones that you've added your own sparkle to, or ones that are covered with donuts, or the ones that you wear once and throw away, let us gather together and bless our face masks. And friends, since this is a pre-recorded worship service, you are welcome to watch it at any time. And if you're watching on our Facebook page, I invite you to like our page and share the worship on your page as well. So after a brief pause to give you a chance to get your face masks, let us continue on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost with the blessing of our masks as a sign of how we show God's love in the world. lay your hands on top of your masks and repeat after me. We bless you and we praise you, O Lord, for commanding us to love one another. Bless these masks, O Lord, as a sign of your love and let my behavior be filled with love for my neighbor. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, as the storms of this life sometimes surround and threaten to engulf us, Help us to know and feel your strength and presence in our lives and in our world. Help us to know, O oh Lord, that you have faith in us, even when we struggle to have faith in you. Help us to know and feel your sustaining love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Psalm 85. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. 
and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. A reading from Romans, the 10th chapter, from the Message Bible. The earlier revelation was intended simply to get us ready for the Messiah, who then puts everything right for those who trust him to do it. Moses wrote that anyone who insists on using the law code to live right before God soon discovers it's not so easy. Every detail of life regulated by fine print. But trusting God to shape the right living in us is a different story. No precarious climb up to heaven to recruit the Messiah. No dangerous descent into hell to rescue the Messiah. So what exactly was Moses saying? The word that saves is right here. As near as the tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest. It's the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. This is the core of our preaching. Say the welcoming word to God. Jesus is my master. Embracing the body and soul. God's work of doing in us what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything. You're simply calling out to God, trusting him to do it for you. That's salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God, setting things right. And then you say it, right out loud. God has set everything right between him and me. Scripture reassures us, no one who trusts God like this, heart and soul, will ever regret it. It's exactly the same no matter what a person's religious background may be. The same God for all of us, acting the same incredibly generous way to everyone who calls out for help. Everyone who calls help God gets help. But how can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? That's why scripture exclaims, a sight to take your breath away. Grand processions of people telling all the good things of God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught Peter, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is one of my favorites. It always has been. Maybe at times it's because I'm a bit too eager, like Peter, and then I find myself stuck and in need of help. Maybe because I know what it feels like to be metaphorically drowning and in need of Jesus to reach out his hand, which he always does. But first, some context. 
We know that all of this takes place early in the morning on a certain day. However, the day just prior to this, Jesus had learned of the death of his cousin and great holy man, John the Baptist. Jesus seeks to retreat and find solitude, probably to mourn, when a great crowd finds and follows him. Jesus then spends time preaching and healing, then feeding the 5,000. After the crowd is fed and goes away, Jesus seeks again to be by himself. So this time, he puts his disciples on a boat to go ahead without him while he goes up a mountain to pray. And as night approaches, the wind stirs up and begins to battle the, the disciples' boat. So Jesus goes to his friends to comfort them in their fear in the quickest way possible. He walks on the water towards them. Of course, we know that this does not calm their fear, not at first anyway, because they think him to be a ghost. But then Jesus is there to comfort, not to cause alarm. So he calls out to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, there's something very interesting in what Jesus says here, and we just don't get the fullness of it in English. In the direct translation from Greek, Jesus says, be of good courage. I am. Do not fear. Jesus knows that his followers and friends are faithful Jews. They know that God spoke to Moses saying, I am who I am. They know that God is the great I am. And so Jesus invokes the divine presence in the name I am that he uses to address the frightened disciples. But those disciples, oh, how they question anyway. Many times it is Peter who speaks for them by being the first to speak. And so Peter calls out, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus simply responds, come. And Peter takes a giant step in faith and gets out of the boat as Peter keeps Jesus in his sights, he walks on the water, but then he notices the wind and the waves all around him, and he begins to sink, crying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand and catches Peter. As Jesus and Peter get back in the boat, the wind stops. And those in the boat are amazed at all the miracles they have witnessed, and they worship Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, even though the Bible was written thousands of years ago, within a time and a culture and a context we cannot fully understand, it is still the living Word of God, and so it speaks truth to us years after it was written. This is one of those stories that I think speaks volumes. There is so much here to be said about Jesus seeking solitude after learning about the death of his cousin. And yet he reaches out to his friends in need, even as he needs time to pray. Much can also be said about Jesus walking on water towards his friends. And then Peter's desire to know if it is truly Jesus, truly the Son of God, by being commanded to walk on the water to him. However, what caught my attention this time was the boat. Oh yes, and that includes Jesus and Peter and all of the disciples. It was the community of the boat that stood out for me in this story this time. It was the boat in which the disciples gathered, and it was the boat in which Jesus looked out for and went to when all seemed to be in trouble, and it was the boat that Peter got out of in an attempt to get closer to Jesus which all starts off well and good, while Peter has his eyes on Jesus, but then suddenly the wind and the waves become too much for him, and he begins to sink, yelling for his Lord to save him. When Peter does take his eyes off Jesus, I think it's important to realize what Jesus does next. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and caught Peter and brings him back into the boat, back to the boat, back to the community of faith. And Jesus doesn't just bring Peter back to the boat, plop him in there with his friends, and then walk back, walk back across the sea. 
Jesus gets in the boat with Peter and stays there until the storm passes. I think when we think about who has faith in this story, we tend to acknowledge that Peter is the one who is struggling to keep the faith. And maybe we look down on him or have pity for him or identify with him as struggling to be faithful, when in fact, this isn't a story about Peter's lack of faith or faltering faith. It's a story about Jesus's faith and Jesus's faithfulness. Jesus invites Peter to step out of the boat and Jesus knows that Peter is gonna try really, really hard to keep his focus on his Lord But Jesus also knows that Peter is going to need help. And Jesus is faithful to Peter by being there immediately to reach down and catch him. Jesus also has faith in the community, the disciples in the boat, and brings Peter back there so that Peter can once again feel safe and secure and loved before he tries setting out on his own again. Hopefully, You can start to see yourself in this story if you haven't already. Because here's the thing. We are in this boat together. This community of faith, this congregation, as unconventional as it feels right now, we are in the boat with Jesus. And that doesn't mean that our boat won't rock at times, because it most certainly will. There will be wind and there will be waves that shake our boat. In fact, y'all know what it feels like in precedented times to have your boat rock. And though I know there are others joining, uh, joining with us through this worship service online, I am speaking directly to you right now, members of Nativity. I know your boat has rocked wildly in the past. You have lived through storms of conflict and pain as a faith community, not caused by God, but by people who love God, but maybe not showing that love in the best possible ways. Your boat has rocked, and at times, as I have heard from some, have felt like it was close to capsizing because of hurt and conflict. But know this, Jesus has been with you in your rocking boat through the storm the whole time. Jesus was with those who were hurt and those who caused the hurt. And Jesus was with all of you who were caught in the middle. And because Jesus has been and will continue to be faithful to each of you, the community of Nativity, And now it seems all of us, not just the people of Nativity, are being tossed about in a different kind of storm, or rather three very big storms. We're living through the storm of these COVID times in a pandemic the likes of which haven't been known in a hundred years, but even the pandemic of of 1918 was dealt with in a different fashion. So We are facing so many unknowns while continuing to live through this pandemic, not knowing where and when the end will come. We are living through the storm of the coronavirus recession. Yes, it actually has a name, which the International Monetary Fund projections suggest that this recession will be the most severe global economic downturn since the Great Depression. We are living through the storm of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is probably the biggest and most polarizing civil and social justice movement since the civil rights era. Three big storms, the trifecta of storms. And this doesn't even include all the other storms you are facing in your own lives that are just exacerbated by living through what is happening throughout our nation and our world. Storms can be scary, anxiety-producing, and life-altering. Storms can show us where we are weaker and need help. And right now, through this 
these storm trifecta times, we are learning the extent of the weakness in almost every single system we have set up in this country. From healthcare and economic to social program systems to school systems to family systems. We are learning and some of us are waking up for the first time to the extreme injustices that black, indigenous, and people of color face every day in this nation. We are seeing the extent to which we can no longer have civil discourse to hear the perspective of the other. This storm trifecta has shown us where we are broken and where we need to grow, where we must grow and improve for the sake of the most vulnerable and marginalized in our society. But storms can also show us the good in people. Storms can show us where God is present. And here's the thing, my friends, that I know to be true. God is with us in these storms. God is working through and with us. God is working through scientists to discover medicines, a vaccine, and other ways to limit the spread of the coronavirus. God is working through healthcare workers who care for the sick and dying and their families. God is working through educators who are seeking new and unconventional ways to educate our kids. God is working through essential workers and those who are doing the hard work of cleaning and sanitizing. God is working through us as individuals and groups as we seek to educate ourselves to change the systems that are broken as we seek to reach beyond ourselves to care for those in need, as we seek to learn about those on the margins and those who face injustice and how we can actively help, as we seek to have hard conversations and understand the perspective of the other, God is there. God is here. Now these storms, they're not going away. Not anytime soon, at least. And the storms you face in your individual lives, they may, be, they may be sticking around for a long time too. But we can be assured that though it may seem like our boat will rock and with certain conflicts, it may seem like our boat just might capsize. Jesus is present with and among you and this community as he was present with and among the community of the disciples. Now, every time we end worship together, be it in precedented ways from our church building or unprecedented ways as we log off of Facebook or YouTube, we are sent forth from this community. We are sent out into the world to face the struggles and conflicts that will sometimes test our faith. Much like Peter, who got out of the boat with conviction and then had a faith crisis that caused him to start to sink, we too will go forth from this community. And sometimes we may suffer minor stumbles in our faith journey. This happens, even with all good intentions of keeping Christ as our focus, we will get overwhelmed by the needs of our jobs or families or friends. In these storm trifecta times, we will become overwhelmed by living through a pandemic and an economic depression and how to respond to the cries for justice from our siblings of color. There will be times where we feel like we are sinking in the midst of these multiple storms. But it's not just us in the middle of the chaos of our lives. We are not alone. You are not alone. Jesus is there to lift us up when we are overwhelmed. And like Peter, Jesus doesn't just lift us up and tell us to keep going. Jesus will always point us back to the community, back to the boat, which is now an unconventional boat that is connected through the internet and text messages and cards and phone calls as a mean of, means of keeping close to each other. But Jesus gave us this community of faith even in these storm trifecta times. And Jesus has been and will continue to be in the boat with us and faithful to you and this community. 
So every time we gather as a community in the boat, we will be given courage to face the storms that sometimes seem to engulf us. And we are given the strength and enthusiasm, enthusiasm to get out of the boat, to go in peace and serve the Lord in the world. Knowing that as we have faith in Jesus, he has even more faith in us. Amen. Friends, I am here with Kim Baldwin, a member at Nativity, and she's going to share a little bit with us about how she is being generous during these COVID times. But before we get there, Kim, you and your husband, John, you joined Nativity like in February. Is that right? Like it's, it was right before we went into, to like quarantine. Pretty much, yes. We've been in the area for a little over a year now, but we had joined Nativity uh, at the beginning of this year. Happy to be members and uh, welcomed by many and loving that congregation and the fellowship, but missing everybody terribly. I know. And, um, and, but you have found a way um, to engage with people safely, but also be generous during this time. What are you doing to be generous with your time and energy, Kim? Well, I had been participating at the Calvary Episcopal Church food pantry that Nativity supports um, before the COVID uh, activity started. I, I was a shopper on Saturdays or I was there on Tuesdays with the manna delivery to help just put the food back up on the shelves, that kind of thing. And when COVID occurred, they just recently or at, at almost the same time, they moved into their new building which is a standalone food pantry building. And it was designed to allow for much more, more freedom of the shopping, et cetera. And unfortunately, 
they couldn't let the people in. But they still needed to provide this service because food insecurity has only increased with COVID, not decreased. So there are still clients that look to that ministry to support their food needs for their families and for themselves. So we are now uh, taking delivery as usual every other, every other Tuesday and it's a busy activity. Then we pack boxes on Fridays and then dispense those boxes to the people who come through the food pantry in their cars. There's no person to person physical contact, but we do still have the interaction with the, the clients in that way. Um, and it's been really rewarding for me to be able to continue that activity for what I've loved to do. John and I both have always had a passion for helping you with food insecurity issues uh, throughout our married life, throughout our time together, because there shouldn't be anyone who's hungry and we should be able to support our communities and the people around us uh, in a way that at least we know that they're fed. Um, it's it, to some degree in, in any way that we can, it's been a, a passion for us. Um, it keeps us busy. The, the pantry sees roughly 85 to 100 families a week. Sometimes that means around 300 people are being served. Um, we are delivering boxes to the cars from eight o'clock till 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. And it's, it's a hectic activity because we're shuffling things around differently than the shopping was. And so it's, it takes a lot of time, but it's a good commitment. And I really feel good about being able to still do it. And I know um, you are one of many, like many as in a, a good sized group of folks from Nativity that do help out at the Calvary Food Pantry. But um, yes. for th those of us that are not directly involved in, in this mm -hmm. um, ministry, what's something we can do um, to help? Sure. The, we do have a, an online sign up because they're limiting the number of people who can be in the building. Um, at any one time because of COVID. And we do all wear masks and we are wearing gloves and we're keeping ourselves distant as much as possible. Um, but on every other Tuesday, there's a delivery time of the food supplies that are coming through. And so they needed probably oh, six to eight people there to help unload the pallets to put the food up on the shelves. And so there's a sign up for that. It's all online. Um, and Heidi Ewing, is now the volunteer coordinator and she's I believe one of our members and so she's coordinating that process and if you're interested in getting involved or being able to sign up you could reach out to her through email um, then again on Friday we have two sign up periods one to do some more shelving of activity of food and then stocking the boxes filling the boxes for and we're filling over 100 boxes every week and it takes time and there's a list that you have to follow because they want to make sure that they have the right food available because we only get deliveries every other week and then saturday morning it's it's again a group of volunteers a certain number of people are needed to carry the boxes to the cars to move the floaters inside the building to moving things around etc so it averages out to i would say at least eight people each of those days are needed. So the volunteers are still needed. And it's physically a little more taxing than it used to be because you're lifting and moving boxes that are heavy. So some of the volunteers have had to back away because of their, um, their ability to do that. Uh, we've also had a reduction in some of the volunteers because of safety. And it is important that all of us recognize that there's still a risk. And so to protect yourself, if you have comorbidities, et cetera, you would not necessarily come and do it. So there's volunteer activities available, um, but I guess I would check with Heidi Ewing to see if you could get on that list because it's a distribution that she sends out. And it's um, sign up genius activity. Excellent. And so either Heidi would be a person to be in touch with or, um, or and you said, could you go to the website and go through the sign up genius that way? Or do you need to go yeah, through Heidi? I, I, I think, I think so. And I'm not a hundred percent. I haven't had to do it that way. So I don't know for sure that that would work, but yes, there's a, there is a website and there's some information about, if not time donation, financial donations, of course, because we do shop. Calvary does buy some of the food that they distribute. And so there's always the benefit of being able to contribute financially to it. And it's a help as well. Absolutely, excellent. Hey, Kim, thank you so much for just taking a moment to share how you are being generous during these COVID times. And maybe it'll inspire some of the rest of us to reach out and be generous as well. Thanks so much. Uh, it's my pleasure. You're very, very welcome.
Take care, everyone. Let us profess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was cru crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Prayers of the people. Praying separately in our homes and together in the spirit, let us pray for the church, the earth, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church around the globe, where Christians are assembling for worship, protect them from viral infection. Where Christians are worshiping with print and screen, grant them steadfastness in your word. Strengthen those believers who doubt your goodness. Bless pastors, deacons, committee members, and other church leaders as they serve our congregations in this difficult time. O oh God, you are gracious and full of compassion. In mercy, receive our prayer. We pray for the well-being of creation. Grant renewal to the air, the waters, and the lands. Save the animals whose natural habitat is threatened by climate change or human carelessness, and direct us towards sustainable living. O oh God, you are gracious and full of compassion. In mercy, receive our prayer. We pray for the nations. Keep the world from war. Pave the way for just elections. Protect citizens from the designs of autocratic rulers. Uphold our courts. Guide our national and state governments to finding ways to redress the wrongs of racism and to ensure equality for all. O oh God, you are gracious and full of compassion. In mercy, receive our prayer. We pray for those who are sick and suffering. Console the fearful, feed the hungry, house the homeless, shelter the runaways, heal the many who are newly afflicted with the coronavirus, and guide researchers in discovering a vaccine. O oh God, you are gracious and full of compassion. In mercy, receive our prayer. We pray for infants and young children, that they may be carefully tended we pray for teens, that they keep patience throughout the contagion. We pray for school boards that they find solutions for the fall semester. We pray for the unemployed, that they find jobs. We pray for medical workers, that they remain healthy. We pray for the aged, especially those in care facilities, that they find companionship in your presence. O oh God, you are gracious and full of compassion. In mercy, receive our prayer. And finally, we pray for ourselves. O oh God, you are gracious and full of compassion. In mercy, receive our prayer. Send your spirit of truth, O oh God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love. For the sake of the world in need. Faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom, with you in the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. St. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, You, my siblings, 
We're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge yourself. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we live out loving our neighbors and those unknown to us by doing the work of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Friends, since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not hold it just as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts. But let us work out its implications in every detail of our lives. And so the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen.
three. Go in peace, serve the Lord. 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 Thank you.